Hello fellow armchair astronauts and welcome to part 5 in our series on rocket engines. In this part we're going to be talking about combustion cycles. Let's cue the intro. All right, uh, lift off and the clock has started. Lift off. Lift off. We have a lift off. 32 minutes past the hour. Lift off on Apollo 11. Discovery, go and throttle up. Roger, nice to be in orbit. Back in episode 2, we drew a simple diagram of a rocket. This included a liquid rocket engine, two tanks for our propellants, one for oxidizer and one for fuel, and a third tank containing some inert gas for providing pressure. The engine in this case is a pressure-fed engine because it is fed only by the pressure in the tanks. We used a pressure-fed engine in this diagram because it's the most simplistic type of engine, but there are several other types of engine cycles commonly used in rocketry. These cycles include the electric pump fed cycle, the gas generator cycle, the tap off cycle, the expander cycle, and the stage combustion cycle. All engine cycles have the goal of increasing the pressure in the combustion chamber in order to increase thrust and specific impulse. Any engine using one of these cycles is known as a pump fed engine because instead of just the pressure in the tanks to feed the fuel into the combustion chamber, they also use a set of turbo pumps. The difference between these cycles is how the pumps are powered. We'll start with the most simple and probably most unique, the electric pump fed cycle. This engine cycle uses electric motors to spin the pumps. Despite the simple design, electric pumps on rockets are pretty new, and only one rocket currently uses a cycle, Rocket Lab's Electron rocket. The limit for this has been batteries. Historically, batteries have been pretty bulky, and a battery large enough to provide the energy required by a rocket engine would add a lot of weight to the rocket, which means less payload capacity. More recent developments in battery technology have made this engine cycle a bit more practical, and if batteries continue to get smaller and lighter, we might see this cycle become common as it offers a lot of benefits over other combustion cycles. With electric pumps, the startup procedure for engines is a lot more simple, and in theory electric pump-fed engines should have lower failure rates than other pump-fed engines as well. But for most high-powered rockets, the pumps require more energy than batteries and electric motors can provide. So now we're going to talk about turbine-driven pumps. A turbine is driven by a hot gas. The turbine then turns a shaft which is connected to the pumps. Most engines use a single turbine which powers both the fuel and the oxidizer pumps. But some engines use two turbines, one for each pump. This allows them to control the speeds a bit better. All of the diagrams in this video are going to show engines using a single turbine though. We'll start with the gas generator cycle. In this engine cycle there is a small chamber added to the rocket engine where chemical reactions produce the hot gas for the turbine. Most gas generator cycle engines take a small amount of both propellants and burn them in this small combustion chamber. The exhaust from this is then fed into the turbine. After powering the turbine, the exhaust gas is dumped out of the engine through a pipe. Some early gas generator cycle engines didn't use the fuel and oxidizer from the rocket to power the turbine. Instead, they used hydrogen peroxide, which would be decomposed over a catalyst to produce hot steam. This method reduced the complexity of the piping in the engine, but added some weight since another tank would be needed to hold the hydrogen peroxide. This method hasn't really seen much use since the early days of the space race, though. Gas generator engines aren't very efficient compared to other pump-fed engines, but they are more efficient than pressure-fed engines. And they're fairly easy to get working, which is why they're so common. Engines using the gas generator cycle include the F1 and the Merlin 1D. The next cycle on our list is the combustion tap-off. This is similar to gas generator, but instead of burning propellants in a secondary chamber, a small portion of the gas from the main combustion chamber is diverted out and into the turbine. This provides about the same efficiency as gas generator, but allows the secondary combustion chamber to be eliminated, saving some weight. The trade-off is startup procedure for tap-off engines tends to be a bit more complicated. Engines using the tap-off cycle include the BE3. The next cycle is the expander cycle. This cycle takes advantage of the changing of phases of cryogenic propellants. And this cycle has only been used on hydrogen burning engines. As the liquid hydrogen runs through the cooling channels on the outside of the combustion chamber, it heats up and becomes a gas. The relatively warm hydrogen gas then runs through the turbine before entering the combustion chamber. This cycle provides extremely high efficiency and far fewer components than other cycles. Expander cycle engines are very limited in their maximum size, so they are usually only used for upper stages as they cannot produce enough thrust to be used on the first stage of larger rockets. And the startup process for expander cycle engines is very complicated too, which is another downside. Engines using the expander cycle include the RL-10 and the Vinci. Finally, we have the stage combustion cycle. In this engine cycle, 100% of one of the propellants is dumped into a pre-burner with a small portion of the other propellant. In the diagram, I'm showing an oxidizer-rich stage combustion engine, so 100% of the oxidizer and a very small amount of the fuel are going into the pre-burner. 
Whether the engine is fuel rich or oxidizer rich mostly depends on what fuels are being used. The exhaust of the preburner is mostly very hot oxidizer, or fuel in a fuel rich engine, and is fed into the turbine. After going through the turbine, the hot gas goes into the combustion chamber where it is combined with the other propellant and burned. This allows for a much higher specific impulse than gas generator and tap off engines because all of the propellant is going through the main combustion chamber and nozzle, and it doesn't have the size limits of expander cycle. Because stage combustion engines can be both very efficient and large, they are sometimes seen as the holy grail of rocket engine technology. However, there are some downsides to this cycle. Oxidizer rich stage combustion engines require special alloys to prevent the hot oxidizer from corroding the turbines. And fuel rich stage combustion is only an option with very clean burning fuels. Kerosene, for example, tends to coke when it's heated, which creates solids that would clog the injector of the engine. So Carolox engines can only be used in an oxidizer rich stage combustion cycle. Stage combustion engines are also much more complex in construction than other engines. Engines using the stage combustion cycle include the Space Shuttle main engine, the RD-180, and the Raptor. All of the engine cycles we've discussed in this video are fairly simple on paper, but like many things in rocket science, getting these to work in real life can be very challenging. One example of how complex things can get in real life is the Space Shuttle main engine. The main turbo pumps on the Space Shuttle main engine were powered using a fuel-rich stage combustion cycle, but it also had another set of smaller turbo pumps before the main pumps. These smaller pumps were used to boost the propellant pressure slightly in order to avoid cavitation in the main pumps. And these small pumps were also powered by an expander cycle, making the engine sort of a hybrid between the two cycles. Basically what I'm getting at is rocket science can be difficult. But if it wasn't difficult, we probably wouldn't find it as interesting. Anyways, this has been Liam from Space is Kinda Cool. Thanks for watching.